Um, good morning. It's great to see so many people here. So this is a Professional Practices Alliance webinar on managing partner performance. I'm Andrew Pavlovich. I'm a partner at CM Murray. I specialise in professional discipline and regulation, mostly advising lawyers and law firms. My co-chair today is Sarah Chilton, senior partner at CM Murray. She's a specialist in partnership and employment law. She regularly advises professional services firms on partner expulsions, exits, arising from misconduct allegations, as well as disputes around remuneration. Our next speaker and fellow PPA member is David Shufflebotham from Pep Up Consulting. Uh, David advises firms on their remuneration systems and also on how they can improve their partner evaluation and reward systems. And our guest speaker today is Jeremy Coleman from 10 Old Square Chambers. Jeremy is a, a leading barrister in the field of partnership and LLP disputes. And he also advises on non-contentious partnership matters. So with those introductions out of the way, I'm going to hand over to Sarah, who's going to set the scene for today's discussion. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, so um, we wanted to have this conversation um, to allow us to, I suppose, take a step back and look at, I guess, in a way, the life cycle of remuneration strategy and decision making. We have at times in the past spoken about various parts of this, but I think it's quite helpful to look at it as, um, as a one topic and think about what you're trying to achieve with your system. And that's what we're going to try and drill into in a little bit more detail this morning. So um, where we're going to start this morning is really taking a bit of a zoom out approach and thinking, what is our overall strategy in our business? And then, you know, is it growth? Is it to address a cultural issue that we've identified? Is it to expand? Is it to pr prepare ourselves to be either uh, the takeover um, firm and a merger or to be taken over? Or, or is it to sell? Um, or, um, you know, is it to list, for example? So it could be any of these things. And then kind of working from that and thinking, well, what sort of behaviours do we want to encourage in our partner group to enable us to achieve those aims? And then I suppose from that, we want to think about and we're going to go on to talk about, you know, well, how can we measure those behaviours? Um, now, I think some people will say, well, certain behaviours can't be measured. David will tell us that, in fact, they can. And he'll tell us how to do that, which I think is the hard bit. And then so we're going to look at that stuff. And then we're going to move on uh, throughout the session to think about, well, what powers do we need um, to enable us to do effectively what David is going to tell us that we should be doing? Um, you know, do we have the power in our LLP deed, in our governance um, documentation to implement these metrics and to drive these changes through our remuneration system that we need to to achieve, achieve our overall strategic goal? Um, and then we will think a little bit about kind of processes and implementation. And then towards the end of the session, we're going to think about what might go wrong and, and the typical challenges that we see, and in particular, Jeremy, Jeremy and I see a lot of this in practice when it when it goes wrong, when people start fighting, when people are unhappy, and kind of how you address them at the time, but also things you can do earlier on to try and head off them in the first place. And then towards the very end, we're hoping to get a little bit of time just to touch on how would you change the system if what you're hearing makes you think, actually, what I've got isn't fit for purpose, or I want to tweak it, but I don't know if I can. We'll touch a little bit about those aspects as well. Um, so we are going to move through it in that sort of order um, and hopefully get through as much as we can. Um, we will take questions. If you want to pop questions in the chat box as we go, if it's appropriate to pick those up as we are going, if they fit, then we'll do that. If not, then we'll try and answer as much as we can towards the end of the session. So thinking, um, I suppose, one aspect, in, in particularly in law firms, that has really come to the fore in recent years in respect of culture and thinking about you know that big picture is what are you trying to achieve is workplace culture and behavior so we thought it might just be helpful andrew for you to quickly bring us all up to speed and i'm sure most people know but you know what is it that the sra expect us to do and and then you know how does that then link in to remuneration yes so as you said the sra have had put a big focus on workplace environments in the last few years and particularly they've been looking at the extent to which workplace environments can result or contribute to individual regulatory misconduct taking place. So they had a workplace environment diplomatic review which came out in February 2022 and that was followed up by these new rules that were introduced into the code of conduct in April last year in respect of the fair treatment of colleagues. 
and that requires partners not just to treat colleagues fairly and with respect etc but also to challenge and to call out other people who are acting disrespectfully or unfairly and the SRA have recently been visiting firms of relationship managers to larger firms to sort of speak to them about what they do to instill a positive culture in their workforces and the sorts of questions they have been asking are you know, what expectations do you put on your, your partners, your leaders of your firm? Do you, do you hold them to a higher standard than others? And also, how do you measure performance? So they're, they're interested as well now in, in how firms measure performance and whether that's just purely in relation to financial metrics or whether they're taking into account other things. For example, you know, are, are you someone whose behaviour has had to be challenged, for example, or, or have you have you challenged? Would they view someone that uh, has actually challenged as, as, as doing something positive? So this focus that is coming from a regulatory, from the regulators on workplace culture, I think it is, is playing a role, definitely. Thanks. And it's worth saying that for those in the accountancy sector, that there is a review um, of the rules in the same um, sort of topic area going on there so you know change may be coming and if we look at what we've seen in the other regulators for example medical regulator they have very much followed the SRA so in that regulatory piece may ultimately become relevant much more widely than than just in the legal sector and um, and so obviously that's all very well to talk about well using these to drive cultural change I think what we find hard is measuring behavior um but uh, you're hopefully going to give us a little bit of a um insight into um you know building an evaluation process that can actually let us do these sorts of things that we're talking about yeah thanks sarah okay yeah so i'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, what might be considered uh, partner remuneration nirvana now so i'm going to talk you through the building blocks of what you need for a successful partner rem um uh, mechanism and there, there are a few things that I distinguish between uh, here that um, that are really important. They're the sort of things you will have in place, but it's important sometimes to distinguish between them and to recognize what they're going to do for you. So building blocks, you know, for reward then. You've got to start off with these three constituent parts. And um, when you look at it, you start at the bottom, often with a profit allocation mechanism. You know, what sort of remuneration system have you got, is it? towards the lockstep end? Is it more each what you kill? How many rungs in your profit sharing ladder do you have? Do you have fixed share partners? How do you move from one layer to the other? Um, how do you uh, breach any gateways that you've got, et cetera? Uh, and, and how much might be in the bonus pool? Do you have a bonus pool? Do you have any reward for um, long-term service and tenure? Um, so all those things that go into that profit allocation mechanism so that's really important. And that's often where people focus uh, first off when they say, well, we're not quite sure if our system's working so well, uh, let's change the profit allocation mechanism. Now, that is fine, but you need the other two things to go with this. So one, you need governance and process. So who is doing what during this process to whom? Do you have partner self-reflection? I.e., they, you know, partners tell you how they think they've done during the year. Do you have partner reviews? Do people sit down with them? And there's a lot of good practice to be had in here. Always, for me, it's about best fit rather than best practice. What fits your firm? What fits where you want to take it, et cetera? But governance and process, clearly important. Uh, often a mix uh, here between what's in your deed and what's in your policies. And, and, and Jeremy will come and talk about that in a, in a moment. Uh, and the final element, which has become more and more and more important to firms and now from the SRA's perspective is where you are going to evaluate partners performance and I always use the firm contribution because it moves you slightly away from that idea that performance is purely about the financials so contribution embodies a sort of wider range of elements from my perspective so I think this is just a better term bit of terminology but contribution evaluation is really um developed over the last i'd say 10 15 years and um certainly uh, in really good contribution evaluation systems you do have the sort of things that Andrew was talking about there where there's an expectation set that partners will act to a high standard uh, and, and higher than than is expected of other staff and also that they will for example call out 
examples of um, a poor behavior and, and poor performance and, and any sort of creation of a toxic culture. But contribution evaluation covers a, a, a wide variety of things. And, and I think always you should be looking for that balance between current production capacity and, and rewarding outputs and looking at some of those efforts that partners put in to build future productive capacity. And those are some of the things we'll come on to later that Sarah has, has mentioned that are, are, are not contained in your practice management system and therefore people uh, feel that they're a bit different to measure. And, and I'd say, uh, again, I think you can evaluate these things. If you talk about measurement, then um, people tend to, to resort to their practice management system because things have got a dollar sign or a pound sign in front of them, which is fine. Um, but you also need a, a more rounded way of evaluating partner contribution, especially in this, this emerging environment. And clearly, and you all know this anyway, so I'm not going to spend any time on it. Clearly, what you want to do is align those things, all your provisions with your strategic goals and your core culture, the positive elements of it, um, and, and any business imperatives you've got. Um, so again, good practice, best practice. The things that people often neglect are how you take those elements and then you translate them into reward. And this is where you need some really good parameters set for yourself as to how you use those things and put them together so you're clear about we look at contribution, we look at our profit allocation mechanism, this is the process we go through, and this is how we translate into reward. So this is the, the bit that joins it all together, the, the rules that you set for yourself that allow you to sew all those different elements together. And the most neglected thing of all, when you're in the midst of this, because it's such a headache, when, you, when you've got a bit of a problem with your REM system and you know it's causing you pain, you tend to take the neurofen or the paracetamol or whatever your choice is to get rid of the get rid of the nagging pain but actually the best way to address it is to look more fundamentally at what you've got to do to to really remove the root causes and usually that means having some sort of strategy that'll help you translate what you're doing on reward into enhanced partner and business performance and increase your profit pool because if you can drive your profit up a bit it makes all of this profit sharing malarkey a lot easier to stomach, both as a leader and for the uh, partners themselves. So um, it's one of the things that I always stress to, to clients is to say, look, let's remember that what we're trying to do here is create an environment where we can enhance partner contribution and therefore um, really propel the business forward. Yeah, one, one of the things that in terms of measuring the data, and this, this is referred to in the workplace from asset review as well, was the use of 360 feedback. Um, and I wondered, David, if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I think 360 is a bit of a vexed topic with um, HR professionals in professional services. I know it's widely used in a lot of industries. In, in relation to evaluating partner contribution, it seems like a really good idea to get 360 feedback to be able to support evaluation of how partners run their teams, how do they work with other partners, how do they share client relationships, et cetera. The only trouble with it is if you try and systemize it and put it online, for example, which is with the easiest way to gather the feedback, you tend to go to one or, one, one or other polls. And I, I know Jeremy's got something to say on this as well, but in my experience, what it ends up with because the individuals are giving the feedback know that it has a link to reward is it becomes very, very bland. And so you end up going through a big exercise of, of, uh, of drawing in the feedback. Uh, and yet what you end up coming out of it is very, very um, um, samey and uh, can't really allow, doesn't really allow you to draw difference and differentiate between how partners are contributing. So my view always with it is, Yes, you need to be able to uh, source feedback from around the business, but it's much better within a professional services environment if you can do that on a curated basis so that you take the feedback, but you have a layer in between the feedback and the individual that allows you to contextualize it and to delve into that feedback a little bit better to draw out proper themes and differentials between what's happening. Otherwise, you tend to get uh, quite a lot of mush uh, and it's not much use to anybody 
and, and that's my experience of it. So uh, I, I'd say something that though the SRA seem keen on it, I wouldn't rush into doing it and try and find yourself a system that knocks it, ticks that box, if you see what I mean. Approach it with caution and do something that fits with, with your environment, I'd say. I think I would add, and I similarly have sort of reservations about it, but from a slightly different perspective. So, um, you know, yes, I'd agree you get the bland feedback, but where we see in where problems arise, that really comes into uh, its own and creates bigger problems is where um, we're being told that a firm is dealing with a really bad performer and we are saying, well, what's the evidence? Let's make sure we can, you know, build the building blocks to exit this person or to, you know, do something that's going to result in them potentially disputing it with the firm. And we look at the feedback and it is glowing because either, as you say, it's very bland or because actually it's been taken from non-partners. So, you know, asking someone junior to report negatively, even if that's the truth on someone more senior, is a really hard thing to do. And so it's just not valuable in terms of either what you're discussing, David, or what I often deal with, which is disputes to try and justify decisions that have been taken. Yeah, I agree, Sarah. Just to add to that as well, another another way in which one sees 360 degree feedback being misused or abused is if you've got sort of tensions in a team and potentially a junior person then uses it as an opportunity to um, criticise perhaps for bullying or something of that sort, somebody senior. And I think one's getting quite a lot of complexity around the idea of how senior people evaluate junior people without them being accused of bullying by giving negative feedback or negative performance reviews. And that's become, I think, quite a problematic area. The other thing that I've seen, which is really horrible, um, uh, generally in a sort of banking financial arena, is where um, you know, come bonus time, uh, you get uh, somebody thinking, well, who are my three biggest competitors for the bonus pool? and then uh, choosing to give extremely negative feedback on colleagues in an attempt to do down their bonuses in order to raise um, their own bonus. So I think it can end up going horribly wrong, as you as you say, David. Yeah, it becomes it just becomes so bland and you can't tell. And, and just to re-echo your point, Sarah, yeah, I've absolutely seen that. You can't differentiate between somebody who's really not good at the people management bit and somebody who's really excellent because the feedback is so bland and there's so little difference. And if you have to try and rely on that in some sort of um, quasi-disciplinary process, uh, that's that's going to be really hard. You know, uh, it tends towards very safety first, very bland, um, by and large, with with the odd with the odd you know the flare up as, as as you and Jeremy have pointed out. But overall, um, yeah, uh, approach with caution. Don't not don't not do it, but try and do it in a way that actually gives you something useful. I think the other thing I was thinking about when you were talking, David, is actually if you get this right and you reward people properly for the contribution they are making, including non-financial contribution, I think what you end up with is a more collaborative and less competitive environment. And I think that produces, in fact, what the SRA wants, which is a less toxic workplace. So I think actually it all feeds in in a different way. But I think you, you can also address toxic culture and people being particularly grumpy, angry, shouting at people, um, you know, difficult about things by making sure that if they're properly awarded for what they're doing, people tend to be happier and happier people are less likely to bully people. Um, so, you know, I think it's important for a number of reasons. Yeah. And, and they, what happens there is they get really grumpy if the remuneration is wrong. That, that's, that's what's happening. It's not that they're delighted when the remuneration is right, because I think that's they do, but they are much less grumpy if they think that if they think it's not wrong. <laughs> So Jeremy, David touched on it a little bit there, but what sort of governance documents do you need to, to sort of support or re to support your, your remuneration, your performance feedback system? Thank you, Andrew. I mean, well, at the risk of starting with a trite comment, good, clear, well-structured documentation. Um, I mean, the starting point for any uh, challenge to um, the exercise of a discretion, which usually these, almost invariably these are, is to look at your... Uh, LLP or partnership deed and whatever policy documents you've got. Um, so I think the important thing is to have documentation that sets out clearly what the criteria are, uh, what's to be considered, what the process is, um, so that everybody knows where they are. And effectively, you've got um, some benchmarks and uh, documentation to measure that against. And I think, as we'll come to a bit later, a lot of the sort of challenge aspect to this is about 
starting with looking at what your powers are, what your procedures ought to be, and then obviously evaluating how management or whoever is the decision maker has gone about uh, doing their performance review and their performance decisions. Um, and if you do it well against good and careful criteria, it's pretty hard to challenge successfully, as we'll talk about later. And I suppose, Jeremy, that would include thinking about when it does go wrong, what structure you have in place to deal with that and so what sorts of things you'd be expecting to see in say an LLP deed versus something that was not contractual to deal with problems yeah. I mean you're, I mean obviously again everybody will know this you would usually see some sort of a remcom and then often you'll have a, an appeal process of, of some sort built into the documentation um, which obviously again has to be followed carefully and I think one of the things that one sees emerging from the cases like um, fairly terrifying decision, Joseph and Deloitte, is the importance of following um, exactly what the procedure is in terms of how you go about appealing uh, decisions. So I, I think um, traditionally and sensibly you have some sort of an appeal structure built in. And obviously you have to give thought to who the appeal is to, because, you know, it's, it's often quite, it's got to be a meaningful appeal. Um, so that can be important to give some thought to as well. And and David, I suppose, and maybe a question to sort of both of you, um, what sort of decisions, I suppose, David first, what sort of decisions do people make as in what is typical? Um, and then I suppose bringing you and Jeremy is, is do you typically see those decisions and the power for those decisions lying in the LLP agreement or in a non-LLP agreement document so that there's a little bit more flexibility as to changing them? So I suppose, David, let's start with what are the, common and what what did you recommend having the power to do yeah okay thanks sarah uh, really important that that all those constitutional documents align with what you're trying to do obviously and the powers typically that i'd like to see in those documents are uh, an ability to um obviously uh, reward adequately and that comes in a number of forms so that's uh, progression or demotion within a within a profit ladder, um, and whether that's got gateways in it, etc. Good criteria for going through gateways, nice and clearly drafted. Good rules for following in terms of how you assess people and make sure that that happens. If they're supposed to have a review, then do the review. But movement up and down in terms of progression, and that includes having clarity over progression from any fixed share levels into equity as well. Uh, I think firms can really come a cropper there um, because they're not, uh, they're a bit scared of being explicit about what that is and setting an expectation. And typically people want to know, you know, how much how much revenue do you want me to bring to the party? They, and, and I know it's not all about the revenue and the financials, but as a starting point, it's really good for your fixed share partners to know the sort of quantum you're talking about that's expected of an equity partner so the, those up and down movements including that breach from um uh, redesignation from fixed share to, to full equity that's obviously key and is a big determinant of how much of your um of your um, remuneration is baked in some sort of flex to move down as i've said um, and generally what i see is 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 uh, an ability to accelerate faster than to move down. So it's a bit like uh, it's a bit like one of those lava lamps. You know, you see the bubbles rise on the heat pretty quickly and fall a bit more slowly generally. Uh, and and I think that's uh, and I think that's good practice really. Um, so up and down movements on ladder and and promotions, um, less common variations in base salary. If you, if you have a notional base salary um, that that people think is 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 always there. I think it's really tricky to have variation in that, but um, some firms are allowed to do it because they see that as, as uh, in certain circumstances anyway, but I'm not so keen on that. Obviously, bonus, if there's any sort of bonus for um, exceptional performance or performance above and beyond the level of, of, of REM expectation you've got at the moment, again, same principles apply. Nice, clear rules. What are we talking about? You can't. Um, uh, you can't actually fully describe what all the exceptions are because otherwise they wouldn't be exceptions uh you know so exceptional um is is just that so 
it, sometimes people try and be really definitive about what that means, but you've got to leave yourself some wriggle room there. Be clear, but be clear that there's a bit of wriggle room as well. That's important. So um, up and down, all those sort of movements, that's that's what you're looking at in terms of the, the REM bit. Um, and also what I'd like to see is that evaluatory envelope, if you like, those conversations that go on, that governance and process to say, look, these should be ongoing conversations. This should not be, and I know this is a trite point, shouldn't be any surprises when you come to sit down at the end of the year. You know? So again, I'm talking about Nirvana and what, and what people should be reaching for rather than what actually happens, which I'm sure you're going to give us a good dose of reality now, Jeremy and Sarah, and, and you can put me back in my box. Well, I suppose the question, Jeremy, is where, I mean, I suppose there's, there's a few things coming out of that, but the first one is where do you put that stuff? So the power to, for example, move someone up and down in gateways, is that, in your view, best put in the LLP documentation? Or is that best put in an associated policy? Well, uh, uh, my experience and my thinking would be it's probably best put in a separate document because it's something you want to be able to easily review and tweak. Um, so generally, you don't, you find a sort of, uh, link to it in the LLP agreement, but then there'll be either a, a schedule or a separate policy document which deals with it. Um, the other thing to to mention is obviously I, I think there's a in my experience, and I expect those of many on the on this call as well. Um, I tend to find that American firms, particularly, have a much more opaque remuneration structure. So it, it's really unclear what they're doing. The, the the answer just pops out of the black box at some point somewhere down the track, but um, I think I would say best practice would be separate document policy, easier to amend, easier to tweak. And just picking up on a couple of other points of David's, um, but one way that I see firms trying to structure things with success often is to have different pools so that you have um, you know, one pool which is very discretionary and then other pools which are less discretionary. Um, and so you give gives you that flex in a structured way. Um, another just a little observation it's a case we're going to talk about in a bit more detail a bit in a moment but interesting comment in a case called Tribe and Elbow Mitchell um, uh, in that case the senior partner had to give substantial attention to quotes financial performance and the judge says of the words financial performance um, financial performance is broader than just partner matter billings that is not least because other matters such as collections on billings may affect our firm performance financially there are also questions of whether a firm is making efficient use of its resources and whether their particular behaviors the partners wish to reward so in a sense you've almost got a bit of judicial blessing but that even if your agreement says it's about financial performance that's more than just about partner billings um, so that's some recognition to the breadth uh, of the approach, which David's been wisely, nirvanally recommending. Yeah, and, and so to pick up on that as well, I see a bit of a difference generally between smaller and larger size firms. Uh, as you as you uh, get bigger, you tend to have a bit less in the deed and a bit more in the policy because you, you're relying more on the leadership, executive leadership, to make decisions on your behalf with some oversight from a partnership council or whatever so that you see that delegation a bit more uh, yeah. whereas in smaller firms the partners are, are, are more have, have more of a uh, of a firmer hand on the on the sort of decision making tiller if you like and i suppose it, one of the issues of, obviously is if you want to change these sort of things and you need say a majority of 75 percent it can be really difficult because everyone's got their own personal financial agenda in there and trying to change something like that can be really, really difficult. So a huge benefit, I think, in not having to get everyone, or at least 75% of people, to sign up to one system. So, so yeah. Jeremy, turning to the actual exercise of the decision, I mean, you did just mention that if done correctly, it's very difficult to, to challenge. But how how can you go away and how can you go and make a decision in a, in a foolproof manner? Uh, thank you, Andrew. Well, I think probably the word foolproof is it, it, it is is back to Nirvana. Um, I think the starting point is that, that any decision in principle, I think, is challengeable. Um, and even words like absolute and sole discretion, the cases are, are pretty clear that that doesn't stop the potential for challenge. Um, so one's got to be on one's toes, Jordan Pickford style, and ready to deal with uh, everything. Um, uh, that said, um, if it's done well, it really is. Uh, hard to challenge so um just sort of unpacking how one goes about doing these type of things well um 
recap sensible well-drafted documentation which are clear uh, as to the criteria that are taken into account thinking about who is the decision maker so what's the power and who is the decision maker and you often get um, uh, firms falling into problems where the wrong decision makers have made the decision um, if there's an appeal process obviously allowing that to play out um, uh, but then um, it's about if you've ticked all those um, boxes, you then go on, obviously, to ask, well, we know what our power is. Have we exercised that power um, properly in the sense of following what's in the documentation um, and the right person or decision maker doing the exercise? Uh, and then assuming that you get to that point, the real challenges are essentially divided into two pots. There's the pot of saying, has this decision been exercised in good faith in the best interests of the of the firm um and obviously for example if um the decision maker has decided to allocate themselves a very large amount of the profits and very little to everybody else that might start ringing alarm bells about whether that's been done in good faith or for ulterior motives um uh, the other main pot of challenges is to ask whether the decision has been exercised rationally in the legal sense um, and by that we're talking about braganza um i.e the two limbs one um have you taken into account the relevant factors and no irrelevant factors and two um is the decision one that is so unreasonable that no reasonable group of decision makers could have come to it um, I think what comes through loud and clear from the cases is that it's actually remarkably difficult to successfully challenge the exercise of that sort of discretion if you followed your criteria and done so in a way that is to use the language of um, uh, of Tribe and Mitchell, uh, Tribe and Elbow Mitchell, uh, within the range of proposals that was reasonable. So you know you can start to see it's it's pretty hard to successfully challenge. It's almost for the firms to lose um, rather than anything else. So the two cases which I think are interesting areas to look at for those people um, who want to think of it from a, a legal perspective. Um, are the decision in Tribe and Elbow Mitchell um, and also a, a chunk of the decision in uh, Reinhardt and Andre, in which I, I was involved with my colleague Naomi Winston. So um, starting with uh, Tribe and Elbow Mitchell, that was a profit allocation case. So Mr. Tri was a disgruntled partner um, who wasn't happy with two years worth of profit allocation. So we're bang into the area of, um, of what we're talking about today. Um, and uh, as I say, um, the decision I had to go through two stages, the senior partner recommendations and the requirement under the schedule uh, was uh, it was a, to be determined at his discretion, but the senior partner was to have substantial regard to the financial performance. And I just mentioned that the judge had, uh, interpreted the word financial performance quite broadly. Uh, and then effectively, he applied those two uh, uh, layers of test. Um, and it's neatly summarised um, by this little passage. The senior partner should exercise good faith in making the recommendations as accepted by the party, should not take into account irrelevant matters nor ignore relevant ones. The proposal should not be outside the reasonable range of proposals that might be made in the circumstances. The discretion here is broad. Um, and that's um, a sensible way of looking at things. Um, he then went on to decide that the exercise of discretion, um, both by the senior partner and by the other partners then accepting the senior partner's recommendation, were within uh, uh, the ambit of reasonable uh, and were not rash irrational in any sense and therefore were upheld. So you see the principle of how you might attack it, but also how difficult that can be if you do it right. The other case, which I just mentioned a moment ago, uh, is buried in the very, very long judgment of Miss Justice Warren in Reinhardt and Andra. So it's at paragraph 410 to 458, which is the analysis of uh, the challenge that uh, we made to the bonus allocation. Um, and a few points that emerged from that. Firstly, um, that there was a, a recognition that if you don't give um, any reasons at all or you don't take you don't as it were have a basis or a reasoned basis for your exercise that can of itself cause you problems 
Um, but, and that wasn't the case uh, in, in Reinhard Nondra, but in, in setting out the legal position. But the judge in that case did say that the, the discretion had not been exercised um, uh, rationally um, or properly uh, by Andra in that case. Um, and what he, he said was that they failed to give proper weight, this is Andra, failed to give proper weight to what he had achieved and improperly took into account what he did not achieve. Um, and therefore they were in breach of their contract. Uh, in 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 failing to evaluate performance appropriately, and a lot of that was to do with the fact that they were uh, not sufficiently looking at the basis upon which um, Henning Reinhard was taken on. That he was taken on principally as a transactional M and A um, operator, and not a sort of relationship builder. Um, and secondly, there were lots of questions about the extent to which one could take into account the fact that they had decided to let him go. In the process. So um, I think the law takes you to that conclusion of one, look at your power, two, look at who the decision makers are and make sure the right person is exercising it, three, consider the appeals process, and then having exercised the process in accordance with your power and the terms of your uh, procedure, then you've got the two um, checks and balances. Is it being done in good faith in the best interest of the firm? Uh, and then secondly, this very important broad um, question of has it been done rationally um, in the sense of have all the relevant factors been taken into account and no irrelevant factors is a decision that's not so unreasonable that no reasonable group of decision makers could have come to it but bearing in mind that the direction of travel of the law is that it's hard to challenge that sort of an exercise of discretion if you've gone about the process sensibly assiduously and carefully so hopefully that's a uh, a bird's eye summary of where the law, I think, is in this in this area. But I think one. So, so just listening to that and just um, looking at that decision you mentioned in Reinhard Nondra, I think people hearing, well, th the firm lost that point because they were said to have not given proper weight to relevant factors. I mean, that might seem quite alarming to some people to think, well, hang on a minute. It, was that way off? As in, did they get it way wrong? Like, as in, were they giving weight to completely pointless things and not giving weight to really obvious things? Or is it really nuanced? Because that could be quite a worrying position to get to, I think. Yes, I mean, I take the point. I mean, I think you're quite right. I mean, I think in that case, a lot of it turned on the fact that they had departed effectively from having set criteria for... Uh, Henning Reinhard, which they were to, said that they would evaluate him against, they then effectively changed the goalposts. So I think that it, it isn't sort of like um, a green light to a broad brush attack on all discretionary decision making at all. It was, um, uh, you know, you have to look at the thinking and the reasoning to see why it's actually um, you know, acceptable. And I think, obviously, I would say this one's like correct. Um, but the other aspect of it, which the judge then went on to say, as a sort of a counterbalance to help uh, ease your worries, um, he said, well, I'm going to uh, exercise the same unfettered discretion as Andra uh, had it, uh, and do it in the way that they would have done had they exercised their discretion reasonably. Then he set up a very um, strong indicator that he would take some persuasion uh, to um, come to a radically different view. So in other words, it was the process, the result, hadn't been gone through properly, but the, the I don't think this is kind of a green light to the courts going, yeah, well, never mind what the firm thinks, never mind what the performance uh, review process is, we're going to do it ourselves. I think there's there'll be great judicial reluctance to get too stuck in and great judicial reluctance to knock down decisions unless they're you know, fairly clearly on the wrong side of a line when you look at what they should have taken into account and what they shouldn't have taken into account. So hopefully that's, that's of some consolation, Sarah. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Thanks. And I think one of the other things that we see where it goes wrong is, and it's much easier for someone to challenge this than I think it is on the basis that you've been discussing, Jeremy, is if there's discriminatory conduct or discriminatory criteria. So, um, and I don't just mean just this criteria that is obviously discriminatory, but in terms of not taking into account aspects that would have affected someone's performance and not even just in the relevant year. So sort of knock on impact of maternity leave, of disability, of uh, sickness absence, for example, that may be related to a disability. I think that is where and, and if 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 someone is advising an individual on challenging a decision 
it is much more attractive to, um, if there is discrimination present, to challenge that than it is to challenge for two reasons. One, the challenges that, Jeremy, you're talking about need to take place in arbitration or high court if they're going to be litigated. Discrimination challenges can take place in the employment tribunal. And um, and also they are just probably more straightforward and more likely, if it's wrong, to get a finding. Whereas well, I suppose what you're talking about is you might get a finding that the decision making process was wrong, but you might not get a better decision out at the end of it. Um, so it's it's another thing. And, and we're not going to get into discrimination in this session because there's just no time and, and it's on top of itself. But it's just a sort of warning uh, point to make. David. And Sarah if I, and, and Jeremy, if I can come in there, because I know you like a good dispute. I, I can't stand them myself. Uh, so, but in terms of, you know, my advice to clients always here, be, because it, it is saying, look, it, if you, nobody wants to end up in a dispute, that, that might happen. You know, we, but you can't guard against it totally. But if you've got a carefully considered set of evaluatory criteria uh, that are well understood, you know, that have been agreed to, um, that have been uh, well explained to the partnership and you're consistent in applying them, you're going to give yourself your best chance of, of, of being as bulletproof as you can be when it comes to, you know, those, those difficult situations where you, where you do have a claim. And, and you know, that, that's, um, that's, again, to reassure people on the call to say, look, you can find your way through this. And uh, if you get into a difficulty because you've got a claim, if you if you've been if you've done that if you've got carefully considered good evaluatory criteria consistently applied you, you're you're on a you're on a strong wicket uh, um, and um, and the second thing I was going to say is one thing uh, one trap that particularly law firms fall into is that when they set up appeals processes they make them pretty much quasi judicial and in their deed or elsewhere, you know, there'll be paragraphs on how the appeal is going to work, etc. And it's very legalistic. And these are actually business processes, even though you're in a law firm, they're business processes. And therefore, you do not need to make them too legalistic. And in fact, my my view is that you shouldn't, they should be straightforward and easy to, to comply with. Um, because otherwise, people will treat it when they get into that position as a piece of litigation, a mini piece of litigation. So there's uh, there's there's room for having appeals. Some firms don't even have appeals, uh, a right of appeal, but there is room for them. But my 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 guidance to my clients would always be make them straightforward, make them a, a business process, not a quasi legal one, because lawyers don't take a, 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 a don't take a second uh, invitation to to turn it into some sort of quasi litigation. <laughs> um. Sort of along those lines, because when people think about challenging things, they obviously will also think about how much information they have. What's your view, David, on transparency? And I don't know, Jeremy, if you've got a view on that as well. How transparent, I mean, Jeremy, you mentioned that certain firms, it's just like uh, something pops out and there's no sort of vision as to what's behind that. What do you think is a good approach in terms of both minimising dispute, but also just getting the appropriate buy-in from people into the system in terms of transparency yeah well i mean i think that's a really great question so i mean look, i think there is a the answer is a bit of a trite one but i agree with what david said i think it's about clarity uh, and people understanding and I, what 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 they're being measured against and feeling that the system is fair i think my experience you know and i echo what david said obviously the aim is to try and avoid disputes um and i think the recipe that one sort of sees bubbling way in most disputes is a sense of unfairness and feeling that they they didn't they've not been treated in a way that um they feel is just um and and i think if you know what you're getting into and you know what the system is and you can see how it's been applied it may not be a result you're particularly thrilled by but at least you feel as though you know i've had a fair uh, shout at it um my experience in terms of transparency has been very variable across different firms, everything from completely non-transparent to the extent that you aren't even allowed to see um, you know, the structure, you're just told the result, through to a lot law firm recently who set me the interesting task of saying, we want all our documents written in plain English, all legalese removed from every document, we want every document visible by everybody, um, and we want everybody to understand precisely what's going on. Um, and, you know, um, that's 
a fairly you know unusual approach but um who knows that maybe um where more things may, may be where the direction travel heads towards but i think bottom line clear um understandable and intelligible and um, so that people feel they're being treated fairly yeah and, and that that concept of felt fairness i think is absolutely critical within it within any system i think you, and you know uh, the the amount of the amount of money that's, that's at stake is important as well. Um, you know, there's, there's a there is a folk saying in Wales that when when uh, money goes out the window, love goes out the door, and I think that's very true of partnerships as well. If if you're on a downward path and people are scrapping over this diminishing amounts of money, then you tend to get into difficulties. When it's all upside, uh, and you, you can let things go more, much more easily, but that felt fairness is really important and transparency and allowing people to understand how decisions are arrived at and why people are in the positions in terms of REM ladder level um, or bonus and, and taking the time to explain those things clearly by the, by the consistent application of, of clear criteria really helps with that. Um, and and what, what I see, Sarah, in terms of REM decisions and where people sit in REM terms uh, it varies. Most firms that I work with um, have a, a decent degree of transparency in terms of where people sit in their REM structure, um, and, and most of those are coming from a coming from a, a UK heritage. Um, American firms are different uh, in, in the way they look at things and, and what uh, what they're allowed to see, but most firms will uh, give you even if they don't give you exact detail on people's REM. They'll tell you what brackets they sit within uh, and or they'll anonymize it. So they'll say, we've got five partners in this rung, four in this, 25 in this other one, and you're sat here. And where where people are, uh, are, are rightly more, um, uh, more cautious is on uh, ratings. So if you've got a system that spews out some ratings in terms of evaluatory ratings, then people tend to see their own rating uh, and though they might get some average ratings from others, either by cohort or division or whatever, then uh, they tend to be more anonymized or aggregated. Yeah. Um, so the ratings bit tends to be more individualized. The overall reward position tends to be, uh, uh, for, for most of them, um, uh, more transparent. But yeah. there, are degree, there are degrees. Um, I suppose just um, before we get on to changing systems or, or tweaking systems and a few points you might have on that um jeremy to come back to you so if a partner considered the decision was either process wise unfairly taken or substantively unfair what might the outcome be for the firm if that person was successful in demonstrating that well i mean i think um first of all the vast majority of such disputes are resolved, um, as is all of our experiences, litigators in this field. And that's a sensible place to end up rather than a courtroom or a full blown arbitration. Often, although the amounts of money are important to the individual in you know cost benefit terms, they're you know, they're not worth a full blown piece of litigation. Um uh, obviously, in some contexts, particularly sort of hedge funds and private equity, that may that may not be the case. Um, but uh, if you go all the way in a challenge, then I think the um, analysis in uh, in the cases would suggest that effectively you're dealing with a breach of an implied term of a contract to act rationally and in good faith, or perhaps an express term. Uh, but uh, and therefore effectively it's a damages claim um uh, but in order to come to the measure of damages the the court or arbitrator has effectively got to work out what the figure ought to have been i think there's a tension running through this as to whether the appropriate thing to do would be rather than to work it as a damages claim to kind of look at quashing it and remitting it back to the decision makers to do it again against the right factors um i think warren's approach in reinhard nondra was to suggest that he would have a go, but um, fairly sceptically, if I can put it like that. So I think those would be the two routes, but it rarely gets that far, in, in all honesty. Um, but I think orthodox wise, it would be a breach of an implied term and therefore uh, a, a, some form of a damages claim or equitable compensation claim. 
Um, can I just add one little thing, just picking up on something that David was saying earlier on? Um, and he mentioned the the very wise point about you know movement from fixed share to equity and having that all clearly in your agreement. Just a small point. Sometimes you get um, firms saying, well, look, Fred has been such a poor performer that we're going to effectively de-equitize Fred. Um, I think that is really difficult unless you've got um, a, a power in your agreement to de-equitize. So you might well have a structure which allows you to drop them down the, the ladder or you know, remove, uh, remove bonus performance points but actually to turn them from a partner into an employee um is what requires the power in your agreement to do that because you are really fundamentally changing their status yeah. um, and you sometimes see that drafted into agreements yeah rarely so if you've been listening to this or and, you, and you're thinking okay maybe our remuneration or performance system isn't driving the right behaviors we need to change it how are you going to go about doing that I mean, what's the first step, David? How do, how do you get buy-in? How do you ensure that you can get this moving? Yeah, I've, I've got an acronym for this, uh, Andrew, and I call it WIMPs. So the first bit is, a, is W and I, which comes from the word will. So um, first of all, you've got to have a pretty strong will and resolve as, a, as an executive team or managing partner to actually do this. Uh, my first thing would be to say to you, really give your system a good review first off to see whether it needs thoroughgoing change. So, you know, if you come to the point where you think, yes, it does, then really sort of gird your loins because you're going to have to you're going to have to see through quite a lot of difficult stuff here. So first of all, Will, that's the first bit of wimps. The second bit is power, is, is, is mandate, that's the M. So do you have a formal mandate to do it now? Often you'll get new managing partners come in with a mandate it's in their manifesto to be elected. Um, yet we're going to change the system. So they might have a formal mandate, but the P bit, W I M P, the P bit is actual power, the real politic of can you, do you have the actual power within your business to persuade people to your point of view that it needs to change? And remember, most firm systems are calibrated to reward the top earners best. And this is especially in eat what you kill systems. Now, so this really is turkeys rewarding for Christmas in some respects, especially on the eat what you kill uh, end of the spectrum. But you've really got to carry the, pe the people with you and you need to do that stakeholder management constantly as you're starting down the process, getting the right people on board, having partner working groups, getting deep into the weeds with some with the people that need it. And the last bit, is, is S is skills. So do you have the skills within your team who are gonna do it or individually, if it's you gonna lead it, do you have the skills to do all that stuff, all that leadership, that communication? And that those are the things that I say, look, WIMPs, do you have these things in place that uh, can actually get you started? And that's before you get onto execution, whole different skill set needed over there to actually make it a reality. This is just to get you to a point where you can say, yeah, we're going to, we're, we're thinking about changing it and we are going to be able to uh, move it through, move, move the, the provisions through. I was muted. I saw someone. Would you have any points to make about, you know, when you come to actually have to change the governance documentation, once you've kind of gone through the thought process that David is suggesting, um, any, I guess, words of warning as to when you come to do that? I mean, look, I mean, just some very banal comments. Be sensible about it. Approach it clear headedly. Try and make it easy and intelligible. Um, and just um, and also think about uh, future proofing it as much as you can or building in uh, at least an ability to tweak it over time. Um, but it, it's about you know playing into that sense of fairness. And that involves a level of everybody understanding where they're at. Thank you. Um, and I suppose uh, we, we've neatly got to sort of 9.59. I don't know if, Andrew, if you had any other questions that you wanted to pose. Um, I suppose what we're, I mean, there's a lot, there was a lot to get through. And I suppose what we, uh, if I try to summarise it, I'd say, you know, go back to the beginning, think about uh, those slides that, David, you shared with us about, you know, what, do you have those building blocks? And then do you bring it all together in the way that, is is for your firm the right approach 
and then you know think through where problems might arise and try and eliminate those before they arise so you know are there bits in your process that you have to do something that you think in practice we never do that well you need to get rid of that because that's just a hostage to fortune so kind of do that sort of audit process so I suppose it's I guess twofold you can know the problems you're having and maybe that's why you're here or you can kind of go through into a bit of an audit as to what problems might arise knowing what problems other people might have and think it through in that way um and it is such a daunting thing to change something like this, I think, as a business, um, because as I think both Jeremy and David have really brought out, people have got such a vested and personal interest that kind of often conflicts with the interests of the business itself. But it's impossible to disassociate those things. So it can be a really challenging thing to do. Um, so for any of you doing it, then obviously, you know, you have our sympathies. Uh, I mean, David, you love it. You love doing it. But like it is it is a difficult one. Um, dealing with partner pay is, is one of those massively contentious topics. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining. If you want any more information about anything we've discussed, then obviously do reach out to any of us. We're all happy to take some questions and discuss anything with you offline. Um, and look out for some more events, which will start to be advertised shortly. So for this sort of autumn period. Um, so I um, hope you all have a really good summer. Um, and uh, yeah, we will hopefully see lots of you when we sort of resume our programme at the end of the summer. And thanks also massively to Jeremy and to David and, and Andrew. Um, and Jeremy, especially grateful to you as a guest speaker for sharing your insights and your views. And I don't know whether terrifying people are not giving them calm, one or the other, but we really appreciate it. Um, and I uh, hope to welcome you back soon as well. Thanks all.